to go. All right, welcome everyone to my webinar. Self care is healthcare. Da, 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 da. You're seeing my screen, right? Just give me a thumbs up if you are. Okay, cool. Yeah, I do these free talks pretty regularly. I'm very interested in like um, in delivering free content. Basically, I think that people should have access to resources for their healing and their health. Um, and they should have them at no extra cost, really. A lot of what we're going to talk about tonight in terms of like what self-care is and how it can serve as a system of, of health care. I'm not trying to say anything too degrading about our healthcare system. I'm sure that there are plenty of degrading things that can be said, but it's not really my place. I don't really feel qualified to evaluate it. I did prepare a slide or two around that. But the bigger point that I want to make is that like if you can make self-care a habit, it's, a, it's like paying health insurance for your own self because it's going to keep you out of the hospital. It's going to keep you out of kind of the healthcare system can be a real mess. You get in there, you've got all sorts of paperwork to deal with. If your insurance isn't good and you're paying way too much money for small procedures, we hear so, so, so much about all this stuff. And I'm like, yes, that definitely needs to be addressed at a policy level. I am all for that kind of stuff, but I'm also about like really empowering the individual and empowering the individual to take conscious action in their own life, to bring themselves more into a state of fullness and, and wellness and, and health. And so part of what I want to talk to you about today is like how self-care really is is an investment. You could think of it like as your monthly insurance payment if you want. And how when you invest your time and energy into your own self, it really, it pays off in spades. And I'm not just talking about investment of money, right? I'm talking about, like I just said, investment of time and investment of energy. So in traditional Chinese medicine, it's, it's interesting. They think of this whole thing as, oh, I skipped my introduction. I guess I really should do that. You guys know me, but if someone's watching this recording, hey, maybe you haven't seen me in this picture on a beach in Mexico, living my best life. <laughs> it's something that happened for me kind of recently. I, I shifted way more into lifestyle driven life, like choosing more consciously where I wanted to be living, how I wanted to be spending my time, um, living a life more in accordance with my values, one of which is, is traveling. So this picture is from earlier this year when I got to go down and spend a, a weekend with um, my coach, Kate, who Rebecca knows, and just had one of these like really cool breakthrough weekends. And I can see it in myself here too. It's like, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a slightly different person here, standing a little taller, smile is a little bit bigger. So that's nice. Anyways, more about me is that I am a 500 hour certified yoga teacher, I'm also a certified yoga health coach, and it's kind of one of the communities that I lead is a year-long coaching program where I bring people on a transformational journey more into who they are becoming and helping them to access those parts of themselves that like they know deep down exist but can't fully <laughs> incorporate or implement. Um, and, and the fun thing is like everyone's at a different stage of that journey. I'll talk about that in just a second. And the third thing that you see here is that I'm also an actor, singer, and dancer. So I bring a really interesting mix of like musical theater and tap dance to, <laughs> to my, my coaching and my, the work that I do with people. Very into thought leadership now, helping people by giving them thought structures that are going to really like solve the, the current problems that they're facing. One of the things I realized about the challenges that were in my path was like my thinking wasn't elevated enough to address those problems yet. And in some ways, I developed the thinking for myself, but a lot of times I just got it handed to me. <laughs> I, I sometimes paid money for it, right? To have a thought structure handed to me, something explained to me. Other times I develop it, but I think we can all be thought leaders in our own lives and you could sit with that a little bit, what it means to be a leader in this domain of thought in your own life. And this whole entrepreneurship thing, it's like unavoidable for me that I, I really actually like it. I like the game of being in the marketplace and trying to trade people equal value for um, what they're exchanging with me in terms of the work that we do together. Part of the structure that I use in my coaching is evolutionary development and integral evolutionary theory, which we'll talk a little bit about in the presentation today. These are the two primary communities that I lead online. 
the one on the left is called Journey to the Peak. It's a month long uh, or monthly yoga online membership that I lead with my co-teacher and uh, partner and we call it Compassion, <laughs> um, Shauna Emrick. This has been a really, really beautiful evolution of a community. We meet weekly on Sunday mornings for a discussion and a, a community yoga class. We offer you classes throughout the week online and a whole course library of different classes and content in there. So um, if you're looking for more ways to work with me after this presentation, if I've said anything that's like remotely useful or valuable for you, I just want you to know that we can definitely continue the conversation either in there or in Journey to You. This is the year long course that I have where I bring you on that transformational journey. So I'll talk a little bit more about those things later as well. So this is actually what my brain was jumping to and I'm glad I stopped and went back to introduce myself. But the way that like Eastern practices and philosophy in general think about health, it's more holistic. They incorporate more, more of like the whole into the thing. So oftentimes like you'll see in the West that people are treating a symptom when really we're trying to look, what's the deeper thing in Ayurveda, for example, we talk about it as like the root, what is causing the imbalance? What's the root of the imbalance and not just treating the symptom. That's like, like just always chopping off at the, the leaves or the branches instead of really getting down into the root of the thing. But the reason I wanted to bring this in, and this comes a little bit more from traditional Chinese medicine is this idea of like chi or life force so this QI word right there is like, that's chi. It's the same, well, yeah, you all know what chi is? You've heard it before maybe, ish, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like in yoga, we call it prana, life force. And so there's also pranayam, which is like breathing exercises. So you could think of prana, I heard Kate say this once and I thought it was fantastic, that it's, it's oxygen plus consciousness. So it's, it's energy that's infused, it's oxygen that's infused with consciousness. So let's just read through this together. The, the chi here, they're saying that chi comes from three different sources. The first source is prenatal chi, prenatal. So life force that is in the prenatal stage of our life is inherited from our parents at conception. Many congenital conditions are classified as disorders of prenatal chi. Prenatal chi is stored in the kidneys and acts like a savings account. It is available for withdrawal when necessary, but difficult to replenish. Okay, so prenatal chi is like a savings account. Second source of chi comes from the essence of digested food known as grain chi. It is best obtained from high quality fresh foods. Third source of chi, fittingly called air chi, comes from the essence of inhaled air. It is obtained from clean air with proper and with proper abdominal breathing and aerobic exercise. The chi obtained from food and air act like a checking account linked to our prenatal chi savings account. If we keep a positive balance in our checking account by eating well, breathing clean air, and living a moderate lifestyle, we use less of our prenatal savings. When our prenatal chi is depleted, we die. Dun, dun, dun. So do you get the analogy? Anybody ever have like that, get that email that's like, your overdraft protection has kicked in. Don't worry, we deducted from your credit card because you were overdrawing your checking account. So that's kind of like this whole thing. And welcome, Michael, by the way. This is my brother, Michael. Um, that's what they're trying to, to get at here. Where'd you go? There you are. Once the checking account becomes depleted, it starts to actually withdraw from the savings account, the prenatal chi. That's actually our first source of chi. Comes, comes at conception. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And so we have that reserve that we can dip into if necessary. But I think one of the links that I want to try to make tonight is like we can keep the checking account replenished by self-care practices. And so that way you don't have to worry about dipping into that reserve that actually doesn't right, right? It's difficult to replenish. Is this resonating? Anybody have a question or comment before I move on? Okay, cool. So before I go a little bit more into the content of what this talk is going to be, you know, the way that I was really framing this is like, you're here because you're probably curious about self-care. 
you might want to up level your life. And it's one of the links I also want to try to make tonight. It's like self-care practices, yes, but self-care practices for who you're becoming. So which, which ones need to maybe dial up? And I'm going to bring us through the chakras in a couple of moments to see where we can make little relations for which self-care habits you might need to do more of and how you can like really use self-care and balance. So anyways, you might be here because like you don't have a self-care practice. You don't have regular self-care habits and you're curious about how to get them. Maybe you're lacking energy. You might also, I, I think you're here because you have a positive and growth mindset. <laughs> you're open to just like sitting with, with me for an hour and listening to me talk about self-care habits. And I think that already just, that already says a lot. Um, I did actually want to say that you guys can all get this workshop. Most of you were here, Rebecca and Michael are both there for it. But um, if you go to, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. If you go to this page and then just scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll be able to um, sign up for this webinar, Matter Over Mind. And it was basically a talk that I gave where I was talking about how like the negativity bias is a real thing, but there are little tricks that we can do to, to override that. Override that. So um, I'd love to, love to gift that to you guys. Okay. I also put dot, 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 dot question mark here because I wanted to hear a little bit from you. Um, so if you feel called, you're welcome to unmute yourself and just share you know, your name, where you're from, if you want, and one or two things that, that brought you in here today. I can go first. My name is Michael. Um, I'm currently in Austin, Texas. And then I think, yeah, I mean, it's, I've done a lot in terms of like making space for self-care, but the, the energy thing, lack of energy is always kind of the question of like, is there some piece that's missing. Um, so that was that was kind of the big one that I'm like, I still have questions about that. So I came to try to see what I could discover. Sweet. Thank you. I'm Emily. Um, I'm living in New York City right now on the Upper East Side. And I've been struggling a lot. I was talking to Patrick about what his next talk should be and we kind of came up with this idea because in my life I feel like at least it's really difficult for me to find yeah that balance of active self-care and things that are positive stressors versus things that are more relaxing and yeah just finding finding that balance as well as working and taking care of my dog and auditioning for things because I'm also an actor so it's just a lot going on and you know no one is going to tell me how to balance it except for myself and finding that mm. within has been a struggle for me i think it's a really good point the whole thing like we insource insourcing is one of the the best ways to know what's needed and it's not always i think the structure that's modeled or demonstrated to us in culture today like you could say that there's very much a trend of outsourcing for what's needed and sometimes like necessarily so i'm not saying we should always insource for everything but going back to this kind of sick care versus healthcare system one of the facets of holistic health is that there's a deep knowing and a deep intuition when you're connected there's a deep intuition for what's needed to bring balance and to bring wholeness and i think we'll talk a little bit about that in the in the coming slides and, and yeah, thanks, Emily, for saying that, too, because I was thinking back to that as I was preparing my slides, like, why am I doing this talk again? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So because you mentioned like your friends, too, sometimes you even struggle with like self-care. Is there anything more you could say about that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of um, I'm 24 and we all graduated during the pandemic. Um, so that alone kind of got us off kilter. But you know, we all moved to the city after having a really structured degree program. And mm. some people, you know, it's just hard because it's basically having two jobs, like finding the motivation to audition after having worked your nine, your, you know, eight hour shift at the restaurant. And meanwhile, and I have friends that are only doing those two things, but never taking time for themselves. Whereas I, on the other hand, have friends who are having a great time and they're working their survival job, but are really stumped at, you know, 
finding time to audition for things, you know, it's, since it's all so intrinsic. Um, and I feel like that's such a universal thing too, you know, even if you're not in theater, it's so hard. There's no rule book on how to manage your time and yeah. coming from such a structured program like school in school is always a big shift for anyone. And I feel like you never really grow out of that. You know, you're always sort of having to adjust. Okay, now I'm not putting enough into this. So let me put more into this. Okay, now this is getting neglected. So let me put, you know, it's always that mm. balancing act. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, you're also reminding me that I can tell the group that you and I went to the same college, but you know, about six years apart, may maybe more. <laughs> like I, I forget 10 oh man so what, what year did you graduate 2020 yeah wow nine years um so nine years apart <laughs> and I just want to say that you know some of the things that you're saying sound very familiar yeah so um, I'm excited you're here okay Rebecca <laughs> okay so um so I'm in a, a pretty big transition life transition and um and marks in somewhat of a transition too and um and so it never ever hurts uh for me to to just keep on filling the tank with all the good stuff to That's reinforce right. and new ideas on how to you know how to keep improving on what I've already established and mm. just keep growing all the self-care that is really, really, really necessary. Sweet, sweet. Yeah. Cool, well, thanks for uh, putting your voices into the conversation. I always really appreciate that. I think it makes, um, I think it makes the conversation an evolutionary one. All right, so what I want you to get out of this talk is basically practical self-care practices to keep you in tip-top shape and I'll, I'll like add on to that like for who you're becoming for really who you are becoming next and what the next stage of your life is defining what self-care looks like for you and in what area or aspect of your life it might be necessary talking about when self-care happens how you can make self-care a habit. So we'll talk a little bit about habit science and then balancing opposites with self-care the yin yang aspects to me, this is really like self-care exists both on the effort side and the ease. The yin and the yang are the fundamental balancing energies that govern the entire universe. They've been a part of the, the patterning and the unfolding of this, this reality that we're in since, since really the Big Bang. Like that's as far back as, as scientists can trace it. And we also see this rhythm in spiritual traditions, even just in the rhythm of the day, the rise and the fall of the sun. So there's a there's a heat, I think, that's necessary for some of our self-care practices that we that we positively stress the body through activities like exercise or or cold showers or cold therapy or fasting. And these are all things that might sound like they're hard or not necessarily pleasurable. And I, I do think it's one of the quote unquote myths that I'm interested in clearing up here is like self-care isn't necessarily just indulgence. I'm all about like, I, I thought I was going to try to take this angle where like self-care isn't, you know, drinking wine, blah, blah, blah. But I looked into it and actually there's articles written on this. And I think where I ended was like, you got to insource, you just got to insource and like know what's right for you. Somebody had made a habit, a self-care habit. There was an article published in the Times. I almost included it in the presentation that natural wine was her self-care habit. And there was some, a couple of reaction pieces written to it. Like, how dare she say this? But you know, when I read the, the New York Times article, it was all about like the research that she did and how she noticed when she drank this wine versus that wine, there was more mucus here or there. So it was like, okay, she's she's running an experiment and like she's in her autonomy and I don't want to take anyone's autonomy away, but I don't, what I don't want for people is for them to be stuck in ignorance that they're actually engaging in a habit in a habit that's creating degeneration instead of regeneration. And we can take a little bit of those habits just to come back to this whole thing. Like we can, we can take some out of the checking account. That's okay. Go out there, enjoy yourself, have a good time. But as soon as we start to dip into that, 
if we're going to use this model prenatal chi, the savings account that doesn't replenish, then we're getting a little bit into the danger zone where you see more health issues start to manifest. And that can go really anywhere, like diseases of inflammation, autoimmune uh, heart conditions. It can, it can go so many places. The risk is just so much higher. So uh, we've got yin and yang. So, and then also it's like there's deeply rejuvenative practices. So I'll draw this out for you um, really quickly here. Well, I can't make any promises that it will be quick, but I'll draw it out. Many of you have heard me in the past talk about this evolutionary spiral, that the, the natural impulse is an evolutionary one. So each level transcends and includes the level that came prior to it. You could even mark these off then as like different stages of, of development. I think one of the things I'm saying is like your self-care practices here, there's going to be some that you probably keep, keep using, but like, you notice how you have more of them as you go up? Maybe you found that like, like just, can you, anyone think of a self-care practice that they have now that they didn't have in the past? I mean, there was a time when I didn't practice yoga. There was a time when I wasn't meditating. There was a time when I wasn't taking regular walks in the woods because, because a lot of reasons, right? And we'll talk about that in terms of like how to make self-care a habit. So I'm all about up-leveling, which is interesting. I find some people are resistant to it. You know, I think it's a little bit too goal-oriented for them. But in yoga, we have this really co beautiful concept of like abhyasa vairagya, detach or relinquish your um, attachment to the results of your efforts. So you'll, you get to have this goal and the goal is an evolutionary one. It gets bigger and better as you go along, but you're not attached to the results of those efforts. And I hear that a little bit in like what Emily was sharing earlier too. You know, there's this passionate drive to pursue what you want and to sacrifice a lot of, a lot of elements of your life in the pursuit of your dream, what you want. And so, um, yeah, I, I guess one of the things I'm really interested in is like really directing that, seeing how my life is getting bigger and better the more time goes on. Okay, but what we do here actually is flip this whole thing on its side and say that in order to stay in what the yogis call spanda or pulsation, when you think about pulsation, you could think like a metronome, click and the click and the click and the click. You could be in rhythm or out of rhythm. And if we're out of rhythm, the spiral looks something like this. You know, it's, and maybe you're too much in stress all the time. So this is something I've stolen from Kate, but like, have you heard her talk about this, Rebecca? Up here, she calls this peak performance. And down here, deep rejuvenation. And so peak performance is things like, you know, physical exercise. We talked about cold. We talked about fasting. Yoga, asana. It's, it's engaging with positive stressors. I think that's a really good way to put it. Honestly, you guys, for me, it's even like getting up in front of you and giving a presentation. You know, as I'm preparing for something like this, it's like, why did, why did I agree to do this? <laughs> it's pushing through. So sometimes it's exposure-based too, like confronting things that you actually have an aversion to. And the more you can engage with self-care practices in this way, the more resilient and strong you can become to move through those. Because they're they usually end up being the necessary experiences that help you get to your next stage of development. Yeah, I have a... I have a slide on integral. We might end up talking about that. We might not. So anyways, what's down here though on the bottom, let me get rid of this one. And we'll just for now make this and this like this. Down here is things like probably restorative yoga relaxation, meditation, body work, massage, 
yoga nidra. I've been doing what's called non-sleep deep rest. Uh, and Andrew Huberman, I don't know if I have that link on hand, but you can just Google it, non-sleep deep rest. It's like a 20 minute, um, they lead you through a body scan and they explain what it's doing in the brain and everything in the beginning, but I'll just put that non-sleep deep rest. Huberman's talking about it a ton on his podcast. Uh, you get the idea, I think. Like, if you want to be in pulse station, you've got to have self care practices that are both on the top end and that are on the bottom end. So, you ask yourself, which ones might I need more of? And see what your intuition points you to. It's probably, it's probably right. Yeah, to, I included this here because it's like, I have this belief that this is kind of what the human experience is like when you're in full balance. And yes, this is a psychedelic artist. He, he used to draw uh, anatomy, like medical anatomy. And then his name is Alex Gray. And then he went into subtle body artwork. And you could see all the channels and the meridians and the lines of connectivity here. So in terms of like, you know, hashtag goals, for me, it's like, okay, what self-care practices do I need to bring myself to, to this place? And, and frankly, I feel like I can relate with that kid staring at the moon. I've had those moments with nature where it's like, whoa, okay, you got me. And I see that like there's connection all around here. So in terms of what's possible, you know, why I felt like it was important for me to offer this um, this talk is like when we're in an age of consumerism, we're constantly being sold to. So if you're not in charge of your habits, someone else is. There's a lot of creature comforts in culture right now. Uh, pleasure is extraordinarily accessible to us. We're in a culture of pleasure also without motivation or hard work to earn that pleasure. And once that balance is established, it's what they call in yoga, akrama. So krama means rhythm. Akrama means out of rhythm. And you're you're kind of stuck in this, like you can't pulsate all the way. You can't fully honor the beat. And so I do also believe that there's an opportunity to evolve how we perceive uh, healthcare in general and how it's like we can invest in, in healthcare for sure. Definitely keep paying your insurance premiums, et cetera. But then also make little investments in your own self through your behavior and your lifestyle. Okay. Um, what is self-care not? Oh, I kind of wanted to crowdsource this one. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I don't know if you guys want to contribute anything, you could put it in the chat or unmute yourself. I'll, I'll throw out a couple ideas. It's like, cause again, I think I put something sort of, you know, tongue in cheek in the email about like, it's not, you know, binging the real housewives of wherever orange county actually where i'm from they have it they have a real housewives which says a lot um it's not it's not emotional numbing you know it's not feeding too much in when there's already stuff in line to process so yeah those again and the, the reason i am sensitive around this is because i do believe self-care is is and can be and should be pleasurable like there's a world in which it, there's pleasure involved here, but I also wanted just to just hear, hear from you guys. Like, what do you think self-care is not? For me, it's not the like full size Snickers candy bar after <laughs> like a long week, but it might be the like really small ones that I'll get like sometimes or a smaller piece of like dark chocolate, which thank you to whoever like looked up and said that dark chocolate has some healthy benefits to it because that drew me in. Um, but I really like what you had two slides before, just kind of acknowledging the, the consumption side of it and the, the kind of commercial or, um, yeah, that commercialized side of like, we're kind of being sold something and being told like, you need this, it's good for you. Every trip to Starbucks is like peak right. self-care. Mm -hmm. um, and I, What's funny is I would always find myself being critical of myself when I would indulge in that in the past. And I found mm -hmm. like with meditation and just more mindful practices, even just kind of 
almost arrived in some ways to like a financial mindfulness of choosing mm. less expensive things to kind of treat myself with, but then also realizing, okay, can you arrive at those moments of self-care without spending money? And those tended to be the more kind of enjoyable ones in the long run, particularly like you were saying, just those moments with nature and kind of mm. figuring out if I can go for longer kind of moments with nature, or if it's even if it's just a shorter moment, but kind of letting that be as satisfying as the, uh, the Snickers candy bar. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that definitely resonates. Thank you. Anyone else on like what self-care is not? Yeah, I mean, what you said about it not being anything that's just gonna numb mm. your feelings or like your ability to process your feelings, that really resonated with me. Cause I do think sometimes there's some merit to just doing something silly and stupid just for the sake of doing something silly and stupid. For sure. Um, especially for people that take life very seriously or there's a lot, you know, it's, it's interesting. I feel like in some ways self-care is like taking a moment to do the polar opposite of what you've been doing in mm -hmm. a way if that makes yeah. maybe I mean, if you're living a truly balanced life, I guess not. Cause you know, you don't want to screw everything up, but like there is something to be said for that. Like if you're constantly on the grind, that's so glamorized nowadays, especially, you know, for actors and stuff, but I'm sure for other things too, that's just what I'm exposed to. But mm. it's like glorified almost like the hard work. And yeah, it's, there's something to be said for the feeling of accomplishment when you do after a lot of hard work achieve something. I also don't think that we need to like quite glamorize the idea of having to like kill yourself for it at the same time mm. and sacrifice your well being. And yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I guess like when you said like, oh, with a bottle of wine and like I watched The Bachelor with my friends. Yeah, it's like trashy reality TV, but it's, you know, it's a nice distraction for a few hours, just a way to unwind after the stressors of a week, you know, like, so I feel like what's not self care is doing more of what you've been doing almost in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Not taking time to do to counter that counteract that. Yeah, yeah, no, you're hitting into the balance piece. You're hitting into um something I have a slide on too of like what happens when we experience pleasure without doing hard work first and, and what that balance is. Anything, anything on your end, Mark or Rebecca? Um, I'm, tr I'm struggling with how to answer this, but um, okay. What healthcare is not? Um, healthcare. <laughs> Well, Kate Stillman always says, and I love the phrase, um, because it's it's something I agree with, because it's something I don't want. I don't want a pill and a bill solution. Mm, I don't yeah. want just treatment of a symptom. Yeah. I want I want to get to the root cause of whatever's happening. And um so to me, healthcare is not treating the symptom. Mm. Um, healthcare is getting to the root and and then addressing addressing whatever the root problem, concern, situation is. Yeah. So it's yeah. not just a momentary solution. It's a permanent long-term one. Right. And the correct one. <laughs> right, right, right which goes back a little bit to something Michael was saying of like, it's not always the thing that's the easy thing to do in the moment. Sometimes it's like the sacrifice. I sacrifice the moment. And when you think about the word sacrifice, it's like sacred is right in there. So you don't sacrifice something that you don't care much about. You actually sacrifice something that is hard to give up, you know, pulling back the comforters first thing when your alarm goes off and putting your two feet on the floor, standing up and going and getting in a cold shower or whatever it is, right? Like, I'm not doing my cold showers right immediately when I wake up right now, but I am doing the like alarm off two feet on the ground. It's going to be a good day. Stand up and 
right now I'm chanting so much. So I just start chanting Japa, I sit by my window. And I'm like, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. <laughs> it's a great way to start the day. You know, I, I sip my water bottle, but these things eventually, and someone said it earlier, but like the reward becomes intrinsic. It might, it might've been the hard thing at first, but now it's just like, I've transcended and included. It's my new normal. And so there is something I want to go back to in terms of what I was sharing on the iPad earlier, because not that one. I'm not suggesting that like all of us is always at one point on this thing. You know what I mean? I believe that we actually have to tend to, to, to ourselves in stages in a way. It's like, I've got some parts that still need self-care practices that are lower down on the rungs and their development. And so I've got to channel my energy and attention towards them and get really specific. And we can actually go right to the model of the, the chakras from here. You've got basically seven chakras and they are also the colors of the rainbow. Sacral is orange. Your solar plexus is yellow. But I have a slide on this for later on. Your heart is green, Anahatasana. Throat is blue. And then they, I kind of forget the top, some sort of indigo violet situation. But there are certain practices that will help you tend to these parts. And we'll, we'll get a little bit more into that next. I think also I have a video for us. Where am I going? desktop too okay so thanks for participating in that part of the, the exercise what self-care is not this is just one thing that i was sourcing from a little bit to like sorry i'm jumping around a little bit with our our healthcare thing rebecca you were just touching on a little bit something from the commonwealth fund a report they conducted in august of 2021 of like how healthcare in the u.s compared to other high-income countries the striking contrast in performance between the U.S. and other high-income countries on avoidable mortality measures points to several intervention or policy targets. How have top-performing countries reduced avoidable mortality? A comparison of the features of top-performing countries and poorer-performing countries suggests that top-performing countries rely on four features to attain better and more equitable health outcomes. They provide universal coverage and remove cost barriers so people can get care when they need it and in a manner that works for them. They invest in primary care systems to ensure that high value services are equitably available locally in all communities to all people, reducing the risk of discrimination and unequal treatment. They reduce the administrative burdens on patients and clinicians that cost them time and effort and can discourage access to care, especially for marginalized groups. They invest in social services that increase equitable access to nutrition, education, childcare, community safety, housing, transportation, and worker benefits that lead to a healthier population and fewer avoidable demands on healthcare. So I briefly touched on this in the beginning, but I, and I used to like probably throw my arms up in the air and yell a lot more about, you know, stuff on a policy level and change that needs to happen uh, institutionally. And now it's like, I look at this information and I'm like, okay, good to know. How can we empower the individual to operate under these conditions? you know, and just so that they know, they know the playing field, right? And then, look, it's also, well, I, I won't say any more on that, but I just included this slide for that reason. Where is the video I wanted to show you guys? Here it is. Okay, so this came from, I think, University of Toronto. Let me just do a quick changeover with my sound here. Okay. So 
self-care. We may see candles and a bubble bath because that's often how the media depicts self-care. But it isn't always feel good in the moment. In reality, self-care is any activity that a person would engage in to reach optimal physical or mental health. It is often seen as the activities that refuel us rather than take away from us, but that isn't always the case. Sometimes self-care means checking a few things off your to-do list, like paying bills so that you can reduce your overall stress levels. It's also important to note that self-care is going to look different for everyone. So it's important to find activities that are going to be effective for you. Things to consider when thinking about self-care are those activities that are going to make you feel mentally well in the long term, like getting enough sleep, eating a healthy diet, getting some exercise, and practicing mindfulness. Those activities aren't always pleasurable for many people, but you can consider what healthy meals make you happy, or how you can incorporate small amounts of exercise into self-care in a way that you do enjoy, like walking to the park. The next things to consider would be those activities you naturally find relaxing or pleasurable, like taking yourself to the movies or having a night in with tea and a good book. It's also a good idea to consider social activities you enjoy with the people you care about. Having the support of other people in your life can go a long way. Self-compassion is a form of self-care and an important skill to learn. How we speak to ourselves and treat ourselves is so important as we interact with ourselves more than anyone else. It's okay if you're not good at it now, many of us aren't. Self-compassion is really no different than being compassionate toward others, but it's those same thoughts and actions turned inward, treating yourself like you would treat a friend. Ta-da! All right. Um, takeaways from that video? Anybody see anything in there that they're already doing for themselves in their self-care practices? I thought that was good. Um, cute, right? Uh, the, the part, I mean, the, the bathtub with the candles thing, I mean, that was perfect. <laughs> that was a perfect image of what most people affiliate with self-care. Right. And um, just take it easy, just chill out. Right, but I right. loved when they said, you know, sometimes it's rather unpleasant. It's paying the bills and, mm. you know, you're getting stuff done. It's got to be done. And um, but all those different steps are what leads to a fulfilling life and so on and so on. But it's doing the unpleasant things, too not just um you know not just the fun easier easier path absolutely which is exactly i think where, where i want to go next with this i put a couple of quotes in the presentation for um from andrew huberman these came from a video that i um i watched recently where he's talking about you know a lot he talks a lot about dopamine and the the pain pleasure balance in our system. But what he was ex describing here is that like pleasure experienced without prior requirement for pursuit is terrible for us. So if there's not a prior requirement for the pursuit of pleasure, it ends up taking a toll. We're finding now that those who will be successful, young or old, or those people who can create their own internal buffers, they're going to be able to control their relationship with pleasure because the proximity to pleasures and their availability is the problem and that's one of the things we were pointing out earlier is like we're being sold pleasure and and really access to pleasure without that requirement for pursuit at every turn if you walk through like even the grocery store it's kind of crazy i, I notice it a lot more now of like the colors and the branding and like the I'm, i pay a lot of attention to the oreo display that changes over the course of the year and i always roll my eyes it's like oh my god what kind of oreos are they are they selling now Anyways, what I like here as he continues on in this video, though, he, he says that a good life, we could say, is a progressive expansive of the things that bring you pleasure and includes pleasure, pleasure through motivation and hard work and understanding that this pain-pleasure balance, if you experience pain and continue to be in that friction and exert effort, the rewards are that much greater when they arrive. 
and I'm a big advocate for the idea that those are also self-care practices. The ones that are like experiencing pain and continuing to be in the friction and exerting effort. So that way we can be in pulsation when the reward, the deep rejuvenation comes later on. Okay, I think really where I wanna take you guys next, cause we're probably gonna wrap this up pretty soon and make some time for any questions is I like I how- thought. Yeah, please. I, I have one thing I'd like to, to latch on to from that. Yeah. And that is um, something that I just listened to yet in the last couple of days about addiction mm. and how addiction, um, and it really ties into what you just covered with Huberman. Addiction can be considered when those things that bring us pleasure become fewer and fewer and fewer. Oh gosh, yeah. But the amount we need to satisfy us becomes mm -hmm. greater and greater and greater. And um, and so, like what you're talking about, uh, or what he's talking about with kind of it's we have such an instant gratification society and mm -hmm. world now and that by delaying that you know delaying and not always gratifying ourselves instantly and you know but we do some work mm -hmm. till we get to the reward before we get a reward um is just that much more pleasurable yeah because we've worked for it we've earned it you've earned it yeah, totally. And then the other interesting thing about this whole dopamine, you know, pain pleasure balance is that, like you were saying, Rebecca, it's more and more is required over time. But since like a seesaw, it's always leveling out between because the pain and pleasure chemicals are almost co located where those are produced in the mind. So if you're if you need this much for pleasure, all of a sudden, it's going to want to do that much of pain. <laughs> And you're going to want to make the pain go. So you do that much of pleasure and then that much of pain again. And it's, it's not a productive pain. That kind of pain is like depressive episodes, you know, and slumps and yoga, we call it tamas, just feeling like super heavy or vata vitiate, like totally like anxious in the mind all the time. Cause your body's still going to be trying to honor that balance, but no doubt the body is good at maintaining equilibrium, right? But it's going to set the equilibrium for the environment that you're providing for it behaviorally as well as kind of like emily was saying you know whatever whatever your physical environment is and if it's someplace like new york city it's a charged charged environment very much is okay cool um where are we going next with this how to make it a habit how can you make self-care a habit where are we there we are this comes out of James Clear, Atomic Habits. He says that every single habit has the cue or the trigger, then the craving for the habit, the response, and then the reward. So when you're putting new habits into place, it's very important not just to think about the habit or the response, but to also implement the cue or the trigger for the new habit. So I'd love for all of you to just like jot down on a piece of paper or put in your mind like one habit you want to start doing or one self-care practice based on everything that we've talked about today so far, positive stressors, peak performance versus deep rejuvenation, how it needs to be in balance. Pick one thing for you and we'll architect the habit because that will be the, the response. Whatever the practice that you choose is, that's the habit itself. Craving, we're not going to worry too much about right now. That will, over time, it will grow. So you'll start to actually crave it. But then what I want you to also identify is like, what's the cue or what is the trigger? And the trigger for a habit is one of five things. It's a person, it's a place, it's an emotion, it's a time, or it's a preceding action. So we've even talked a little bit about, and they covered it in the video as well, positive self-talk and self-compassion. So maybe there's a self-care practice around, you know, how you are in relationship with yourself when you are in your workplace, where you're always around certain people. Maybe that's whether it's an audition setting or whatever it is that you do for work. When a certain emotion comes up, 
What's the self-care practice that you need to insert to then get to the reward? Because now we get to talk about you guys. This There is a reward. The reward fits somewhere in the equation. What we want leading up to the reward, as has been suggested in a couple of these slides, is that there's a little bit of work into it. Yeah. So if you're trying to, if, if you have something that you know that you're doing that's antithetical to self-care, these are some suggestions of how to break that. You make it invisible, you make it unattractive, you make it hard, you make it unsatisfying. If you're trying to build some new good habits, you make them obvious, you make them attractive, you identify what the reward is gonna be, why you want it. You make it as easy as possible, which many times for people with goals means like setting the bar very low. Like a lot of people are kept from their goals because they set the bar too high. It's not bad to set the bar high, but you also want to make it something that's easy enough that you're going to do it. And you got to make it satisfying. You got to notice the, the reward from it. Yeah. Triggers. I think that's all on that. Anybody want to share their, uh, what, what experiment are you going to run next in terms of your self-care habit, trigger habit reward? Anyone want to share? I can share. Nice. Um, Cause I've done a lot of work trying to build habits and I've talked my wife and I both kind of talk about it, examine parts of our day. And the one thing that I've really dropped off, um, I think it's been the past like two years now for me, it's just been my yoga practice. Like I've adopted mm -hmm. a really good, like little morning, energizing workout routine that fits really nicely into my compact like morning schedule. But I had a good kind of rotation with like yoga that I would do after work. Um, so I'm trying to look for the cues in like when I get home, like if there's a time like changing out of work clothes and into like just my evening clothes or like if I do it right before bed, um, mm -hmm. And I can hear like the little things of doubt or questioning being like, well, if you do it right before bed, you're only going to do this certain type because you're not going to want to sweat. You're not going to want to do that. So um, I don't know. I just like, I want, I know I want to bring it back in the way that I had it as part of my, uh, my life in the past. Um, it's yoga, right? Like, yeah. And just, yeah. I mean, for me, what that looks like is a 10 to 20 minute video. That's kind of prompting me and guiding me. Right. Um, well, maybe the we'll, commitment's we'll also we'll like not, maybe it's not daily at first. Okay. Maybe it's weekly for like three weeks and then you, you do it also two days a week or whatever, yeah. you know? But yeah. I feel like if I can squeeze it in right at that after work time, um, I'll ask you this though, because I saw reward on the circle mm -hmm. is I know the intrinsic reward is like, you're healthier, you're more mindful, you're more flexible. Um, are there external rewards that like I could put for myself? Like if I do it, can I get the little mini Snickers bar? Not the big one, but just like the little one. I'm asking you for permission, but I you think, don't have to give me permission. No, I mean, I think honestly, it's like, I think the rule applies. If yeah. you did the hard, if you, what was it? Prior requirement for pursuit. Yeah. And I think even if it's like, cause then you could take the conversation to another layer of like, depends on how much sugar you're having all day. You know, if you've already had three cans of soda and, you know, a pastry for breakfast, maybe not. But if that's your reward and it's like something with scarcity, you know, around a reward that can make a reward really sweet. I had this conversation with a, a guy who's in my group, actually, and he was saying he has a hard time with rewards because he. I don't know, it's they're the things that he's not allowed to have. He wants the reward to be the thing he's not allowed to have. And to me, I'm like, well, that's more on, on the level of thought for you. Like, I think there's probably a more evolved way to think about all of that. And your body can probably handle, there's a thing called the allostatic load. You're, we need, we can handle some. We put weight on the allostatic load actually when we stress the body. But anytime there's too much, then you're starting to suffer. So another way to maybe think about the question is like, so long as you're not depleting that, um, that savings account. Huberman's posting a ton too right now about people's different propensities and tolerance levels for alcohol. 
And that a lot, there are physiologically things where some people can drink a lot without really getting affected in an intoxicated way, right? And maybe we all know some people who just like throw them back. Or you've been to a country where you're like, oh my God, like they're, they're just out drinking me. Um, so I just want to bring that back to like, Michael, your, your own awareness of like self and what balance is. So <laughs> thank you. And I feel like I like have definitely greatly improved my awareness of myself. So if I can get it to stick, I definitely think I'd be comfortable adding that little extrinsic reward there. It's just like a little, I don't know, the little ding of the bell to let me know that I met the goal. Yeah. Let your taste buds guide you too. I treated myself to some ice cream today and a couple hours later I was like, oh, mucus, no. And it was just so clear that like, oh, that's what created that you know, and, and now I know. So the awareness is, is locked in. Okay. Anyone else want to share a habit that they're going to put in, in terms of next level self-care practices? I was just going to say to Michael, Michael, don't forget to architect your environment. Mm. Get that, get your clothes ready. Like that when you're going in the morning, when you're going to work or whatever, set them and you know, know where your yoga mat is going or lay it out or whatever. I like that. No, because I know and I've read I've read some of the advice where it was like people talking about their morning workout and like sleeping in their exercise clothes if they're ready. <laughs> but it would be doable for me to like to leave the yoga mat because it's right there underneath my bed. I just have to pull it out. So I think seeing it kind of like coming home and seeing the dog that wants to be walked, like seeing it would get me uh, to do it. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I don't know why this, I just, as, as you were talking about the workout flows, Michael, I just got this full flash back into like junior high, high school gym clothes. <laughs> and probably from this time of like, well, what's the easiest first thing I can put on in the morning for this like 7 a.m. PE class? Go run the mile. Anyways, Rebecca or Emily, want to share which habit you're architecting? It's okay, because actually I have one more, I have a couple more slides I want to show, and I want to be respectful of all of your time too. So um, actually it's a good, it's kind of a good lead in for me to talk about, um, let's see, where are we? Because really like where you want to go next with this is you want to make sure it happens. Like everything Michael is saying is like, how can I ensure that I get follow through on this? This was the, um, if you're looking for a, specific self-care practice that you want to align with any one of your chakras it's a very accessible thing i know sometimes this stuff might sound like woo woo but like if you look into it it can be very very practical so your root chakra self-care is anything that connects you to the earth root chakra is all basic needs so your fundamental needs are met financially you have food in the fridge you have a roof over your house so practices that you can do for this are you know meditation, repeating affirmations, breathing exercises, gratitude for what you have, practicing yoga. Sacral chakra, second chakra is all about getting creative, spending time in water, dancing, getting creativity going. Second chakra is sensuality, it's sexuality. Uh, it is flow. The yellow one, solar plexus, Manipura. This is all about confidence, positivity, passion, self-esteem. So things you could do are write a self-love list. There's certain yoga poses that like activate the chakras too. Painting with yellow colors. And these are all just like run, run little experiments for yourself. Eating yellow foods. Notice what you notice. So you get the idea. I'll throw this link in the chat. And you can check this out in your own time. There's the chat. if that is interesting to you. But I'd love to offer everybody who's here a free strategy session. I really appreciate you guys coming through tonight and I appreciate your contributions to the conversation too. And what I was just saying a moment ago is like, if you wanna ensure that you're gonna get follow through on these next level self-care practices um, for yourself that you've identified that you need to utilize to bring a little bit more balance to your life, a little bit more ease to your day, a little bit more energy to your body. Basically what we do in a strategy session is like we take a look into your goal and why you want that goal. 
Because as soon as you start to articulate that stuff, you're forming new language. I'm really into this idea that Ben Hardy, a behavioral psychologist, talks about in terms of all transformation is linguistic. So when you could start to put some language behind who you're coming in the lifestyle, behavior, and diet changes, and social practices, and relationships that you need to kind of be a part of your life to allow you to be the person that you want to be, and a, a person who's growing and becoming, not just staying the same week after week after week after week. There's actually things that you can do to get that. And I'm here to provide you with like the accountability and a strategy session. We also create a plan for you. We look at the obstacles that might be blocking you and how those obstacles are actually probably in service of your growth. So that's a, it's one of the joys of my job is like actually getting to do these with people. So come through for me, book your strategy session. And then I also want to offer everybody who's here, I'm actually getting ready to do another round of enrollment for Journey to You. It's kind of crazy with Journey to You and, and Journey to the Peak. I started them both in like 2021 between February and May. Journey to the Peak started in February. Journey to You started in May. I've already graduated people who've worked with me for a whole year. And it's so cool because I'm still in conversation with a lot of them. And there was a woman in class the other day who was just saying like, how much the year really changed her life. And I can definitely take some credit for that, but it was more so like the way that she got to show up in the structure that we created together, the group accountability of like, I, Emily was touching in on it earlier. We have the habits of the people that we're around. Rebecca definitely knows this being in a lot of like Kate's communities. So you have the habits of the people that you're around. You have the thought patterns of the people that you're around. And if you want to elevate your habits, if you want to elevate uh, your self-talk, the way that you think about your growth, your development, get around a group of people who are having a similar conversation and on a trajectory that you want to be on. To me, that's journey to you. It's the, it's the highest value thing that I offer. Uh, it's a $3,600 investment for the year with this coupon. So I've got 10 of those spots. I'm offering this to anybody who's at this webinar right now or watching the recording. So you have this coupon, $400 off the price. $3,600 for the year, it might sound like a lot, but um, one way I like to think about it, it's like, it's like 10 bucks a day. <laughs> and go back to that thing of like your currency of chi. You know, how, how are the balances running in your checking accounts? And if you feel like investing in your health, investing in yourself is going to be a good return on investment, what you're going to get from that. It's another thing that we can discuss in this strategy session. All right, you guys, any last minute questions, thoughts, comments, or takeaways based on all this self-care stuff? I just really like the phrase and I was like thinking it I don't know if I was thinking it before you said it, as you said it, or just right after you said it. And I thought I was thinking it the whole time, but that phrase of empowering the individual um, mm. just feels like the right kind of phrase for the moment too, of just like people can kind of, they, I know like that, just that idea of kind of feeling empowered to make those changes for themselves, feeling empowered to, to want to kind of know what they can do differently and, having the support system to, to help empower them um, just mm. seems really significant to me. So I'm glad that you phrased that that way. Yeah, it's been a fun, it's been a fun thing to tap into for myself. And it's been fun trying to turn, like invite people into that for themselves too. So I'm glad it, I'm glad it resonated. Cool. Well, if you enjoyed this, feel free to let me know. And if you have any friends that you want to pass the recording along to, I will certainly be happy to send it on to them. Um, similar, if you know someone who's kind of like stuck in a rut right now and could really use something like this, it can make a big difference to just have them watch some of the discussion that we talked about, or I'd be happy to get on the phone with them too. All right, you guys, thanks so much for coming through and uh, have a great rest of your evening, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. Bye, everybody. Bye. Yeah.